For those who have just joined us, welcome to the annual meeting of the National Academy of Medicine. I thank you all so much for attending. Held every October, the NAM annual meeting is the gathering of our distinguished members and the most important meeting of the year for our organization. Today's program promises to be most stimulating and impactful. For this, we must thank our plan program planning committee, chaired by Dr. Jeff Bowser and comprised of a great group of NAM members. The complete list can be found on our website and thank all of you for your hard work. We use the same live stream all day, which can be accessed on our website, nam.edu. On the website, you find today's program, speaker's bio, disclosure statements, information about the planning committee, and other relevant background. I encourage you to take a look. In addition, the meeting's being live tweeted on Twitter using the hashtag NAM meeting, spelled MTG. Please join me in the conversation. Now, it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Bill Gates. Bill, who does not need any introduction, is the co-chair of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which they co-founded in 2000. Guided by the belief that every life has equal value, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation works to help all people lead healthy, productive lives. In developing countries, it focuses on improving people's health and giving them the chance to live themselves out of hunger and extreme poverty. In the United States, it seeks to ensure that all people, especially those with the fewest resources, have access to the opportunity they need to succeed in school and life. Bill's influence on global health is profound. Under his direction, the Gates Foundation has invested over $10 billion in the Global Health Initiative over the last 20 years. These investments have saved millions of lives across the world. These championed pandemic preparedness. Presently, in 2015, he warned of the dangers of a lethal respiratory pathogen. Over the years, he's urged the world leaders to take such a threat seriously and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have committed substantial resources to help the world prepare for such a scenario. He is also a major leader in the fight against climate change. In 2015, Bill created the Breakthrough Energy Coalition, a group of individuals and entities committed to clean energy innovation, followed by Breakthrough Energy Ventures in 2016, an investor leader fund focused on providing patient capital to support cutting edge clean energy companies. He co-chairs the Global Commission on Adaptation, which was launched in 2018 with a mandate to encourage development of measures to manage the effects of climate change through technology planning and investment. And so now, please join me as we welcome Bill, who will be speaking on Crisis Fast and Slow. Thank you, Victor, and congratulations to the National Academy of Medicine for your 50th anniversary. The organization has had a profound impact on improving health in this country. It's also had a profound impact on me and the work our foundation does. Your members like Bill Fahey and Helen Gale have influenced how we approach disease eradication and inequality. Other Academy members like Keith Klugman and Chris Elias are key leaders at our foundation and serve on our COVID response team. Chris was recently on the committee that produced the framework for equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccines, which was released earlier this month. And most of all, I want to thank the National Academy of Medicine members who've been on the front lines fighting the virus. A lot of people talk about not wasting a crisis we shouldn't. We should make sure that these sacrifices make a difference as much as they can and that the world takes away the full measure of lessons from this tragedy. COVID-19 has been an instructive adversary. It's exposed incredible gaps in our preparedness and our health system, like not being able to ramp up testing. And it's also focused the research community on 
uh, areas like diagnostics, antivirals, and new vaccine platforms. These technologies will not only help us fight this pandemic, but also future pandemics and infectious diseases more broadly. There's even ways of using these platforms to fight other diseases like cancer. COVID-19 is also teaching us about the other great crisis of our time, climate change. I know these crises are different in many ways. Uh, one is fast, spreading across the world in a few months. And the other is slower, taking decades to build up the weather change that uh, will cause so much damage. I also realize that bringing up climate change uh, when we have the urgent work still to end this pandemic uh, you know, may seem untimely. But uh, in the case of climate change, we also have to work on an urgent basis. Uh, it will take decades, even after we have breakthrough innovations, to make the progress we need. As bad as COVID-19 has been, the damage of climate change will be even worse, and there won't be just an intervention like a vaccine to bring it to an end. Over a million people have died of COVID-19. Uh, that's a, a death rate of, of 19 per 100,000. With climate change, uh, we could see deaths at over uh, three times that, 73 deaths per 100,000, uh, and rising as time goes on. Uh, the death toll only captures part of the problem. Uh, we'll have economic damage that will lead to huge instability in large uh, parts of the world. So the idea that we need to be ready in advance is common uh, to both of these challenges. And we have a wake-up call on both of these. Uh, for greenhouse gas emission, uh, we really need uh, to get the numbers down and eventually uh, not have that warming continue. The world has a lot to do here. Uh, we emit about 51 billion tons of greenhouse gases, CO2 equivalent, a year. And that's the number that you have to drive to zero to stop the uh, constant increase in the temperature and other uh, very damaging weather effects. How do we get to zero? Uh, well, there's some similarities here with COVID-19. Just changing our behavior uh, will only take us a limited distance. Uh, we have to have uh, advances in science and innovation uh, to solve the problem. And with COVID, uh, wearing a mask and doing social distancing, that's made a big deal in reducing the spread and therefore reducing the sickness and death. Uh, but those won't uh, drive uh, the disease down to zero. To do that, we need a system with diagnostics at scale, uh, good treatments, and uh, most importantly, a vaccine that reduces transmission. The same thing is, is true with climate change. The change in behavior, like driving less or flying less, is helpful, but nowhere near sufficient. Uh, 2020 is a great example of this. Uh, you know, we've cut down uh, carbon emissions with these drastic changes in the economy. Uh, but uh, the reduction in emissions is actually quite modest. When COVID-19 hit, air travel effectively stopped. Car travel last April was half of what it was the year before. And even so, the International Energy Agency estimates that the global emissions only drop about 8% this year. That's 47 billion tons of carbon instead of 51. You know, we don't want the global recession that we're experiencing right now. And even so, that reduction is quite modest. And so simply uh, shutting down is not going to get to our goal. So just as we need breakthrough innovation for COVID-19, we also need that to get rid of emissions from all the different sectors and bring down climate change. Uh, 
This crosses many areas, how we make electricity, how we uh, make industrial products, grow food, cool our buildings, and uh, all of transportation. Some of things like uh, wind and, and solar power generation or electric vehicles for passengers uh, have made progress. And as we scale them up, they will uh, make reductions. Uh, we need even more infrastructure like transmission lines and charging systems. Uh, we need to keep improving the batteries uh, and deliver almost a miracle level of storage uh, so that the intermittency doesn't uh, eliminate the reliability that, that we count on. We also need completely new uh, innovations. Uh, but like the COVID-19 vaccine, we also can find those if we make the right investments in R&D and create policies that encourage these innovations. Another lesson uh, that comes from uh, COVID and applies to climate is the need to help the middle-income and low-income countries as well. Uh, climate change will affect uh, people in wealthy countries. Uh, we've got wildfires, uh, we have floods, uh, lots of negative things. But the suffering in the world's poorest people will be on a much larger scale, even though they're far less responsible for these emissions. A farmer in Nigeria or India uh, you know, may have only an acre of land to feed their entire family. And because the force is completely beyond their control, suddenly they have uh, too much heat, drought, floods, uh, locusts, all sorts of things that can drive their family uh, all the way to starvation. This is not a hypothetical issue. These events are becoming more severe, more frequent, and millions are already uh, suffering. So just as we must make sure that the COVID vaccine gets out to the entire world, we need to develop the farming practices, seeds, uh, so that uh, these smallholder farmers aren't uh, set back dramatically. The only realistic way to get global emissions is one that still allows uh, communities to increase their standard of living, uh, to use more transport, more electricity, more light, uh, have uh, better houses. And so we need ways of providing all of those things that are completely clean without driving the price up so that uh, poorer countries, including even India, uh, find them absolutely affordable. And I think a final lesson is this need for cooperation. Uh, even though we don't have a COVID vaccine yet, the progress we've made uh, is because of cooperation. And we're even going to have to cooperate in terms of making sure the vaccine gets uh, to where it needs to get. We don't want a pure price-driven bidding war which we saw for some of the uh, ventilators and protective equi equipment at the start of the pandemic. So figuring out a plan that embraces all countries, uh, including low and middle income countries, uh, to get vaccination out to them is important. Uh, so far, uh, we don't have that plan. Uh, the coverage would only be 14% in those countries, even though it would be 100% in the rich countries. Uh, and so this, uh, I do believe we will step forward uh, and, and fix this, uh, particularly the rich world governments. There's been some progress on this. Uh, it's also very much in their interest uh, because we've got to stop the disease everywhere before we can go completely back to attending large public events. We've looked at the different ways of getting vaccines out, and Northeastern University did a model for us uh, that said that uh, allowing unchecked spread uh, by only getting the vaccine to the rich countries would double the total number of deaths, uh, and that means more lockdowns, more economic da damage. Likewise, in climate, uh, countries cannot solve this on their own. Uh, just a nationalistic approach or ignoring the problem won't get us there. So we need a global cooperation. Uh, in the COVID case, that means uh, far more capacity in diagnostics at lower cost, 
many treatments, including things like monoclonal antibodies, uh, vaccines uh, that uh, avoid the sickness, reduce the transmission, and, and a way of delivering every single one of those things, uh, just like for climate, where it's about that clean energy technology and, and making sure every country has the ability to switch over uh, with new infrastructure. COVID has been incredibly devastating. Uh, we can't even measure all the, the negative effects. Climate uh, is the same, and it's even scarier. Uh, but I believe that you know, innovation, uh, cooperation, uh, you know, the kind of things that brought us together after World War II to think about uh, not uh, using nuclear weapons, the kind of advances in science that we've seen that have made health so much better. I think that uh, will uh, make us expect our governments uh, working together to anticipate these problems, to make the investments in advance uh, to avoid uh, the damage. So we, you know, we've got this alarm bell, and it's not just about pandemics. Uh, uh, it's about acting together on very tough problems, driving the innovation, uh, creating the policies for deployment. And, and so I am optimistic, both uh, that we can end the pandemic in the years ahead and uh, that we will uh, face the challenge of climate change and be able to get to zero to minimize the damage. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for a tremendous remarks and setting the stage for the important conversation on COVID-19 and the climate change to follow. Let's have a round of applause for him.